Curiously enough, acupuncture is not just sticking needles into people. It's part of a coherent and observation-based medicine that experienced practitioners of the art have handed down over the centuries. I'm Michael Max, your host and guide of Everyday Acupuncture. Listen in as we explore how you can apply the principles of this ancient medicine in your everyday life. This episode of Everyday Acupuncture is sponsored in part by the Seattle Institute of East Asian Medicine. Seattle Institute has been training exceptional clinicians since 1994. The program at Seattle Institute represents a modern take on the age-old model of apprenticeship training. One experienced teacher working with a small group of students focused on the clinical interaction with a patient. Using this approach not only provides students with the highest level of clinical training available today, it also grounds the program in the traditional methodologies used for centuries in the training of medical professionals. Seattle Institute of East Asian Medicine is accepting applications now for the master's and doctoral programs beginning in September 2018. For more information, go to www.siom.com. Dot edu, or visit the show notes page for this episode. Hey folks, welcome back to Everyday Acupuncture Podcast, episode 82. Holy smokes, I think I've been doing this for like three and a half years now. Can't believe this podcast has gone on as long as it has. Sometimes you start something... And you think, maybe you'll do it for a little bit. Next thing you know, years just fly on by. Why do I keep doing this thing anyway? Well, one of the reasons is I get this opportunity to talk to all kinds of really interesting people that have something to say about Chinese medicine or Chinese philosophy or something about the healing arts that hopefully you guys are all going to find really helpful. Today, my guest is martial artist. Now, the interesting thing about the martial arts is it also has deep roots into the Chinese sciences and the physiology and the philosophy of the old Chinese science. So today I'm sitting down for a little conversation with Jonathan Bluestein. He is a martial arts instructor from Israel. And in addition to martial arts, he's got a rather extensive background in psychology. We're going to get into some interesting connections between the psychological world, the martial arts world, and the medicine world. So I'm looking forward to getting into this. Jonathan, welcome to Everyday Acupuncture Podcast. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so glad we're here to have this conversation. You know, there's some books of yours that I've been looking through. I know you've got a lot of experience with, uh, with martial arts, cultivation practices, Chinese medicine, Chinese philosophy, they're all part of that. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what you have to say about all this stuff. And, and where I'd like to begin, just very quick and brief, what set you down this path of martial arts? What, what was your initial impulse? What, what got you started with all this stuff? Well, you know, we live in a world where a lot of people feel that they're missing on something right? That, that's something that, that pervades in our society. And for many people, it's a source of frustration and even depression at times. Mm. And I gather that a lot of it often has to do with people really not finding their path. And sometimes that's just due to sheer luck, because you can stumble on a certain something in life, often early in life. And that some, certain something ignites a, a, an inner desire within you which may have been there, you know, from even before you were born. I'm not, not talking necessarily about the concept of past lives and such. I'm talking about the biological ancestry that you've got from hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution, and even just stuff that, that's from your parents' lives and your grandparents. And it's oftentimes people are just born and they do something and it's right. You know, mm. then the best example might be Mozart. You know, he was born... And he was already a musician and he just had that inborn ability and inclination. Some people call it talent, but it's, it's more than that. It's an accumulation of experience, some his own, but some came from before. And we have to admit that. And we see that, you know, in cats and dogs and 
I was lucky enough when I was young to be exposed to these most trivial things like uh, the Ninja Turtles show, you know? So <laughs> when I was a kid, um, everybody knew the Ninja Turtles, but when I watched Ninja Turtles, you know, it ignited something. It set a spark and, and I sort of knew that there was something there in those movements that they're sort of doing that I wanted to follow. I couldn't quite point my, f my finger at it. I was a little kid, right. but I knew it's, it's something I want to, but, but it touched you in some way. Yes, yes, I was touched. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important that we help young children, especially uh, before the age of 12, to be touched in that manner and to recognize when, it, when indeed they are being touched because you know, children are just chaotic creatures. They, they, they like something, the next day they like something else. But in between all of these things they like and dislike, there's this something often one thing or two or three things that really, really touch their hearts. And these are their inner inclinations. And for me, that, that, that's what led me for the years to come to, to martial arts, you know, to martial arts practice and uh, that and other things. And, you know, for many people, it was Bruce Lee. Uh, part of this. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, so, yes. I mean, I've, I've met people. They found their way to Taiwan. They found their way to China because of bruce lee or even you know that old show kung fu right yeah definitely kung fu with david carradine i feel that you know these people bruce lee david carradine they had an influence on people's lives far beyond what they had originally intended and because they're vessels they're vehicles for delivering this ignition directly into people's hearts in a very intricate social subconscious manner. They're really like vehicles of mass social change. And they didn't even mean that. It was just by who they were and what they were doing with their lives. So I ended up um, doing some Western boxing. Then I moved on to Okinawan karate. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, found my way into the traditional Chinese martial arts, which are closely related to Chinese philosophy and Chinese medicine. We'll talk more about that later. And the main martial arts I practice and teach are Xin Yi Chuen, Pi Gua Zhang, and Juklum Southern Mantis. Again, Xin Yi Chuen, Pi Gua Zhang, and Juklum Southern Mantis. I would have the names in the show notes, right? For people who... Mm, absolutely, yeah. yep. So the Juklum Mantis, I should say, I have not taught yet. So I'm still studying. Uh, we, we should all... Even when we get to be teachers, we should all remain students. That's that's very important. Too. Oh, man. I was I was just in Nanjing, China, mm -hmm. and one of my teachers from, I mean, acupuncture school twenty years ago happened to be in China at the same time. And I said, "Hey, you're not that far away. Why don't we get together? We can go hang out in Dr. Huang's clinic. This is a, a, a teacher of mine that that I like to go see from time to time." And he said, "Yeah." So we met for dinner. And then the next day, my teacher, who's been at this 40 some odd years, walks into Dr. Huang's clinic as a student. <laughs> Man, it doesn't get better than that, does it? You yeah. know, <laughs> always learning. It's so important. Very important. And, mm. and it gets difficult because the more experienced you are, the more difficult it is to be humble and the more difficult it is to, to find people to make you feel humble again. But for mm. someone who had been a teacher for a while, regardless of the subject matter, could be Chinese medicine, martial arts, could, could be teaching the piano. It's just a bliss, the feeling of being a student again. So um, I, I do want to mention just uh, very shortly my, my, my list of teachers, because the, the, our teachers are the well from which we drink, right? And so many people, especially in the martial arts nowadays, they see they omit to mention where their skills and knowledge came from. And I wouldn't be here talking to you today if it weren't for my teachers. So very shortly, um, my first very meaningful teacher was Itzi Cohen Sensei, who is nowadays a colleague and a dear friend. He's a teacher of traditional uh, Okinawan karate. And he has a, a fantastic book on uh, Okinawan history, if anybody's interested. It's called Karate Uchinadi. That's a very history-focused book, a great book. And then uh, my teachers in the Chinese arts are Shifu Nitsan Oren, who is also a TCM doctor from Israel. His teacher, uh, Master Zhou Jingxuan from Tianjin, China. 
Again, we'd have the names in the show notes. And Sifu Sapirtal, he's my Juklum Sovereign Mantis teacher. And in the field of Chinese medicine, uh, although I'm not a practitioner, uh, I have studied and learned a lot from my friend and colleague, Professor Steven Jakovitz. He's the head of the traditional Chinese medicine department at Bridgeport University in Connecticut. So those are my teachers and I respect them a lot and I cherish their teachings. We don't even get started without our teachers. And they keep us going too. I mean, it's amazing. It's not just that you get started with someone, but so often we learn from them our entire lives, right? Like we are just saying, they're probably consummate students themselves, yes? Yeah, you know, I, I gather that most of what we learn from our teachers is not being said. It's what they do. And it's what we observe them doing. This is why it's so important as a martial arts teacher. And I've written a book called The Martial Arts Teacher, uh, which discusses that um, alongside many other things, is that you set a good personal example at all times because the students are watching. Mm -hmm. And the students we know, you know, we see our teacher, we see them when they make their coffee, when they go to the restroom, we see them all the time. And we observe the things that they don't think are even being observed. And we study a lot from that. You study from your teacher's body language, from his manner of speech, from his or hers uh, vocabulary, from the manner in which they touch people. You know, I teach uh, Xin Yi Chuan, and it's a, a Northern internal Chinese martial art. And in the traditional Chinese martial arts, and especially the internal arts, touch is very important you reach a person's heart oftentimes via touching them. And the different people at different times need the different type of touch. You know, sometimes someone's very stiff. In fact, oftentimes they are very stiff. You know, we Westerners sitting on our chairs and being so ego driven, we tend to be stiff. And to soften up a stiff person, you, you need to work with a yin and yang approach, with the Taiji approach. So you have to approach and in a very non-threatening way, sort of very gently massage them with their fingers where they are stiff and suddenly their chi flows. Suddenly they don't feel like being stiff anymore. And if you can do that, not just when you're teaching, if you can do that when you are touching hands with a partner or free, with an opponent, then that's a high level in the martial arts. When you can use empathy, which is in my opinion, the highest level in the martial arts, empathy, uh huh. Tell us a little bit about that. I, it, it's interesting you should bring that up. I've I've been reading some things about empathy lately, and and listening to some things. A guy named Seth mm -hmm. Godin, who ostensibly calls himself a marketer, but he's like one of the greatest teachers of empathy that I've run across lately. Tell us a bit about empathy, and especially how it relates to the martial arts. Well, first of all, the word empathy. Many people. Uh, confuse empathy and sympathy and and it, and and they can be uh, easily interchanged in the English language depending on what you want to mean but it under my personal definitions sympathy would be to put yourself in the other person's shoes so that means you imagine how it is to be the other person to to empathize on the other hand to use empathy is to feel to physically feel what he feels and maybe this is the more difficult skill among the two. Now, the reason I say empathy is the highest skill in martial arts, in my opinion, people think also there is this misconception that empathy is a skill that's only used for good. But actually, you can be very empathetic and a very negative person at the same time. There is such a thing as negative empathy. If we look at fascist leaders the world over, many of them have high levels of empathy, but they use it in negative ways. So you can empathize with people in order to synchronize with their emotion and then deliver negativity into them or encourage them to develop negativity within them. Um, the, the difference between empathy and sympathy, uh, if, if I were to use the terminology of the late Carl Gustav Jung, uh, who had a very profound theory of consciousness, then sympathy would be introverted feeling and empathy would be extroverted feeling. So those in the know would know what I'm talking about. So back to, back to the martial arts though, uh, just to, to make the connection here. 
Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Bring us into the know here. Now you you really got my attention with that. Yeah. There sounds like a yin yang internal external. Well, f first of first of all, we have to uh, just um, uh, get this explained about the martial arts. Just in two sentences, when you can use your empathy to connect with your opponent, to really feel what he feels, then you can control him. But to do that in the midst of conflict and a physical confrontation, when the two sides you tend to feel threatened. And they do threaten each other. And there is a very negative vibe going on, very negative chi. In martial arts, we might call this uh, often sha chi, killing chi. It's a, very, mm -hmm. it's a very negative killing intent. To be able, in the midst of that, to really connect to the heart of your opponent, take advantage of that, for good or for worse, you know, because you, you may not want to injure someone. Maybe they're drunk or they're on drugs, they're not attacking you because they mean they have any ill intent. It, being able to do that is very high level in the martial arts. Some people are born with that ability. If we take the example of Mike Tyson as a human being and as a fighter, I believe Mike Tyson has very high level levels of empathy. But he used that empathy in fighting to become a very, very successful boxer, and one of the greatest of all time. He's a very empathetic person. And he had been so from a young age. You know, when, when they uh, discovered his talent for boxing, he was growing pigeons. He still does so. You know, it's it's a hobby of his. So a very empathetic person, and and a kind seems to be a kind person too. But not getting into that, going to to what you wanted to to learn more about uh, Jung and introvert feeling, extrovert feeling. That that's a very interesting subject. That that's not related to the martial arts. I am uh, an avid researcher and explorer of Jungian personality psychology. Uh, most people are familiar with Carl Ried Jung with respect to his theories about ego and um, his, you know, his history with Freud, um, whom he wasn't really a student of. He was his colleague. He just studied with him for a very short period of time. And, and his archetypes, everybody is talking about the archetypes. But Jung had a different, uh, not competing, but parallel theory about human consciousness in the field of personality psychology. And what Jung discovered is, in, in Chinese terms, is a manner of applying the Taiji and the Bagua to personality theory. So to, to just make it uh, simpler for readers, we have the Taiji symbol. The Taiji symbol is a symbol that has yin and yang within it. And within the yin and yang in the Taiji symbol, evolve the Bagua, the eight trigrams. So these are eight manifestations of yin and yang combined together in different ways. So there can be just yin and yang as, as, two, as a pair, as just one yin, one yang, and there can be eight manifestations of them. And from these eight stem the 64 hexagrams. All right, we're talking about the I Ching here. Yes, yes, of, of course. And from the 64 hexagrams, the Chinese say that stem the 10,000 things, which means everything else. Okay. so. In Jungian personality psychology, every single person has what's called the cognitive functions. And each of us has eight cognitive functions. These correspond and correlate, in my opinion, with the Bagua, the eight trigrams. So in each of us are eight manifestations of yin and yang. Now, the, the basic yin and yang in the, in the human psyche, in the human mind and body, are of course the masculine, the feminine. So like in the Taiji symbol, we're not all male or all female. Each and every one of us, even if I'm born a male, I have a feminine side to me. And if someone's born a female, she has a, a, a masculine side inside of her. That's why in the Taiji symbol, they're yin and yang, but there are these tiny balls within them. In the, in the big black fish, there is a tiny white ball. In the big white fish, there is a tiny black ball. So, that's the basic of it. But what, what about the psyche? So Jung, who, who, by the way, read the I Ching. The I Ching is the Chinese classic that explains this entire theory about yin and yang and Bagua and, and the 64 hexagrams, etc. So Jung had read this book very early on because he happened to have a, a friend who translated that book, I think, into, into German. Jung was a German-Swiss. So he was familiar with the theory, and strangely enough, he did not correlate it with... Uh, his personality theories, but I see that there, there must be a correlation. I think he didn't say that back in the day, 
because we're talking the early 20th century and no one would have understood you know, what he's talking about. So he didn't mention the aging, but it's correlated. So we have eight cognitive functions. What are these? We have, what are the components of the human psyche? According to Jung, we have thinking, right? We are all thinkers. We, we have the capacity to think. We have feeling because we all have feelings. We have intuition because we all have intuitions, which are not feeling or thinking, right? The intuition is something different and separate from thinking and feeling. And we have sensing. Sensing is the connection to our senses. So there's sensing, thinking, feeling, and intuition. And now that's just four of them, right? So how do we get to eight? Because if we have sensing, intuition, thinking, and feeling, that's just four. Because we have introversion and extroversion. Now, people don't know that introversion and extroversion are words in the English language which were created by Jung. They come from him. In, in the manner that when we say an extrovert, a person who is an extrovert or a person who is an introvert, that comes from Carl Jung. He's not given credit for it due to politics in the world of psychology, a lot of people preferring Freud's theories and his successors to Jung, but Jung conceived that. And so if there is extroversion, introversion, there are people who are extroverts and people who are introverts, then there is also extroverted and introverted feeling, extroverted and introverted thinking. So here's the yin and yang of it. So if mm -hmm. there's thinking, it can be either extroverted or introverted. If there's feeling, it can be introverted or extroverted. So uh, talking about just what it means to be an introvert or an extrovert, according to Carl Jung, the simple explanation given nowadays in the United States, when people explain this, they say, okay, you have your, you know, psychic battery, you have, you, you need to charge your energy. An introvert charges his energy or her energy when they're just alone at home or in nature. They just need to be by, by themselves. They can go to a party. They can be among people. Perhaps they really enjoy it too but they need more time with themselves than time with other people to charge themselves psychically. And then extroverts are people who need to be among other people to charge themselves. They can't be alone too much. They might be alone for two days, but that's too much for them. Then they need two weeks to be among people, mostly among people to, to charge their emotional batteries. Otherwise they, they, they feel trouble. They, they become anxious. They can become depressed, etc. Now this is very important and uh, fundamental thing to understand about human beings because th this is the major cause for strife and conflict in families when you've got maybe two parents who are extroverted and then the child is introverted and the parents oh yeah boy. you know the parents what's wrong with our yeah, kid yeah well why is he in his room yeah. all day long <laughs> why are my parents always bugging me <laughs> definitely so what <laughs> happens there is the parents constantly want to be around their kid because they like company. They like they enjoy your company. They want it all the time, and we get excessive about our strengths, right? And then the kid that doesn't understand what we do, don't we? We do get excessive about our strengths. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. So um, these parents they take the kid around to meet people all day long, and that kid becomes anxious and depressed, and they don't know what's wrong with him. Well, what's wrong with him is that he's just not like them, and they have to understand and respect that. But if we don't understand that there are extroverts and introverts in society, then we have a problem because we cannot relate to other people. We, we are lacking in sympathy and empathy here, right? Yeah. So what, what I'm curious about here, how is extroverted empathy different than introverted empathy? Do those look different? Do they feel different? Or are they expressed in different kinds of ways? Yes, most definitely. So not extroverted and introverted empathy, extroverted and introverted feeling. Okay, that, that pertains to feelings in general. Feeling, right. Okay, yeah. Feelings in general, yeah, yeah. So people tend to associate introverted feeling and extroverted feeling together, then introverted feeling, uh, thinking and introvert and extrovert thinking together because thinking goes with thinking and feeling goes with feeling. As a matter of fact, that's, that doesn't work like that. In fact, the... Um, the partner of extroverted feeling is extroverted thinking and the partner of extroverted introverted feeling is introverted thinking and not their partner it's not their counterpart what it, it's meant by that okay i'll explain so for instance um introverted feeling and introverted thinking what these cognitive functions do you can't have both of them operating at the same time okay usually you have 
one that's more dominant, that's very dominant, and the other that's not so much. And the introverted feeling, introverted thinking, they are what I call personally, that, that's my theory, the way I explain it. They're called value functions. What do I mean by value functions? You use these functions in your psyche to give values to things. So people with high introverted feeling are very good to give in giving emotional values to the world around them. And they also engage a lot in giving these values to things. So, so for instance, uh, they would say to their partner, you know, I want, I want to talk to you. I want to understand the value of our relationship. I want to define what this relationship means for us. I want to understand better what I feel towards my children, towards my cat, even towards something that's nostalgic for it. The, the introvert feeling is very nostalgic. So de defining the, what it means on the emotional level. However, someone with introverted thinking, as opposed to introverted feeling, gives logical values to things. So if you have high introverted thinking, for instance, you tend to be very good at math because you give logic. That makes sense. You know, you put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. This is logical that all, most of the engineers, uh, programmers, architects, these people, not always, but often they tend to have high introverted feeling because it's easy for them and they do it all the time giving um, logical values to the things around them. That makes sense because like uh, Rene Descartes and, and these types of people, uh, possibly Isaac Newton, uh, I cannot say, but maybe. But however, that, that being said, that's, that's value functions, introverted thinking and introverted feeling. But there is the extroverted thinking and extroverted fe uh, feeling. They are very different. What do they do? They are extroverted. So think the, the value functions, they, what, what, what question did they ask? They asked, what does that mean to me? Right? That's a very introverted question. That's the question that they work through. Of the extroverted functions, extroverted thinking, extroverted feeling, they work toward the object, not the subject. That's, I, I didn't say this before. That's Jung's definition of extroverted and introverted. Jung said that the extrovert, the extroverted person, looks towards the object. So he looks outside of himself. And the introverted person looks inside of himself more. So he, the introverts measure the world according to what's inside of them. They compare the world to what's inside of them. The extroverts need to see people and need to be out there in the environment and interact with, with things and with phenomena because they define themselves and their feelings, their cognitive functions, but by what's out there that's more prominent in their in their psyche and we you know what we have the opposite bias in spiritual traditions in the orient to what we have in modern society in modern society we prefer the extroverts you know people who get out there who are party people you know who who can celebrate life who don't stay at home all day long you know who don't cultivate their inner selves but in oriental spiritual traditions we have the opposite bias exactly because they tell you, you should be able to sit and meditate for three hours. Well, it's nearly damn impossible for an extrovert to sit and meditate for three hours. They might be able to do it for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Maybe really? with training, they can do it for more, you know. I was thinking they could do it for more like three minutes. <laughs> Most of the time, yeah. But it, Yeah, I'm thinking about myself here. <laughs> but it doesn't mean, you know, a, a monk might say that if you can't do it for three hours then there is something, something might be wrong with you or you need to correct yourself. But actually, no, these people are oriented towards mm -hmm. uh, the outside. They need, they, they have a different function in life and in society. They have a different calling. So back to, sorry, I didn't define uh, extroverted thinking and extroverted feeling. And that's very important. So they're not value functions. They don't look to the inside. They, they're extroverted. They look to the outside. And they are what I call sinking functions. They try to sync with the external environment. So the extroverted feeling is what, what's actually true empathy. People with high extroverted feeling, they synchronize with the feeling of their surroundings and with the, especially with the feelings of other people. Those are these very highly empathetic people. They can just see you and they see through you. They can touch your heart with just a few words. Because they're actually extroverted feeling. Yes, they're feeling 
shoots to the outside. Their feeling yearns to connect with something outside of them. And they are experts in, at creating that connection. They are born with this innate ability, but they also develop it to a high degree throughout their lives because that's one of the main things they do. And then extroverted thinking does the same, the same type of synchronization, what with, but with people's logic. So it, it, I am relatively higher on extroverted thinking, so I'm good at synchronizing with the mindset of other people. I synchronize with their logic with what they say, and I kind of connect with that on the logical level. So people with uh, ex high extroverted feeling, thinking, sorry, extrovert thinking, they tend to get good at managerial positions. Why? Because they are good at managing, you know, the logic outside of themselves, connecting with the mindset of other people, not with their feelings necessarily, but with how they think. Right. So somebody who is high with extroverted thinking, if they're interacting with someone else, that other person might go, wow, this person really understands how I see things and how I get things. Mm -hmm. But on the on a very logical thinking level, not on the on the level. Exactly. Of yeah. No, not so much on the feeling. And then, of course, there's the others, extroverted feeling that the, the person sort of I'm going to say the target of that would go, wow, this person really understands my heart. He really knows who I am, what I'm about. Mm hmm. Yeah, definitely. And and this this brings us back to empathy and sympathy. So I would say extroverted feeling is the true empathy because you feel what the other person feels. You know, for an extroverted feeler, when they see another person crying, they, they start crying or they feel like crying on the inside. They might not do it, but they feel like it. They feel what the other person feels. With the introverted feeling, an introverted feeler, they're also very sensitive to the emotions of other people because they're feelers, but they kind of put themselves in the shoes of the other person. They don't feel exactly what they feel. So that's sympathy. So introverted feeling is sympathy and extrovert mm -hmm. feeling would be empathy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it all gets very complex because from these eight functions that each of us has is, uh, is created a, a the 10,000 things, right? Yeah, yeah, but but before we get to 10,000, we have uh, 64. Well, th there isn't there isn't still a theory that explains the 64, but based on the eight cognitive functions uh, uh, and, and Jung's theories, people have been able to create what's called the 16 personality types. Now, people in the United States listening to this know the 16 personality types as the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs Test Instrument. That's a very common uh, personality scheme that simplifies Carl Jung's theories by uh, creating these 16 personality types and explaining how they these types interact among themselves and in society. Yeah, it, it's a commonly used uh, psychological instrument. Often people in graduate schools, people in management. Yeah, it's it, on the internet. I'm sure you, know, you could very quickly go find it and, and look that up. I think a lot of us have been exposed to that. But this is the first time that I've really thought about, and, and partly, you know, it's from this conversation with you, thinking about how extroverted feeling would be perceived by somebody on the outside. So, it, in, in, in this, I mean, this gets very slippery with language. You've got more experience with this than I do, but just for me, listening to this for the first time, thinking about that there's feeling, there's thinking, there's introverted aspects of it, extroverted aspects of it. I'm. Let me just go back for a moment. I, some time ago, I was in Taiwan. I've got a friend there who's a Buddhist, and she translates lots of Buddhist texts. And and I, I love the conversations I have with her, even though I often don't understand what she's saying. <laughs> it's it's good food for thought. But I remember at one point. She hands me this really annoying riddle of sorts. And she says, okay, when you're thinking about subject and object, when you're actually looking or thinking about anything, I mean, you could be looking out across the room at, say, a bookshelf like I'm doing at this moment as we're having this conversation. She says, okay, so that bookshelf, where does the bookshelf end and your perception of the bookshelf begin? It's a very annoying question because it's one of those <laughs> questions, right? It puts you in a mental loop. Well, it 
it puts you in a mental loop. And at the same time, it can put you, am I more looking at the bookshelf? Oh, yeah, there's this object out there. Or am I more paying attention to my perception of the bookshelf? Which brings me back to what we're talking about at this moment. There's an introverted aspect of me looking at this bookshelf, my perception. And then there's the extroverted aspect, the bookshelf itself. Mm -hmm. Where I put myself on that continuum. It's like quantum mechanics, you know. In quantum mechanics, you have the particle and you have the wave. Mm. And, and when scientists examined it, they, they, they discovered that the particle and the wave are just the same thing from different perspectives. So if you look at it one way, it's a particle. If you look at it another way, it's a wave. So that, that, that would suggest that introverts and extroverts, you know, they see the same thing, but they see it from different perspectives. Yes. And, and why should they see it from different perspectives? Uh, evolutionarily speaking, I think that it's because those 16 personality types with their cognitive functions and different ways of thinking and feeling and sensing and intuiting about the world, they have different roles in, in society. We need all of them because each contributes something very different to, to our society. And let me drop a big, big bomb here for those among the listeners who know a little bit about Chinese philosophy or Chinese medicine. So in Chinese medicine, we, we know that we try to integrate the theories of five phases and bagua. Okay, the five phases is based on, on the number five and the bagua is based on the powers of two. And, and, and it's very difficult and, and it's quite brilliant how the ancient Chinese doctors managed and, and philosophers managed to coincide these so, so-called competing theories which seem to just not correlate so well because they're structured very differently. So now in psychology, however, in Chinese psychology, the, the structure of the Chinese psyche is based on the five phases, right? Mm -hmm. But what the, China, the structure of the Chinese psyche doesn't have so much is an explanation based on the Bagua and the, and the yin yang of things in a Taiji point of view. So how about maybe if Carl Jung was actually the person who discovered the Bagua structure of the psyche that can correlate with the five phase structure of the psyche described by the Chinese? What if that's the missing part? All right, clue us in here. Now, now you really opened up a can of worms. Mm, yeah, that, that's something that, that I came up with. I, I've never seen anyone suggest this. So that it's like what's going on in Chinese philosophy and Chinese medicine is somewhat akin to what's going on in physics nowadays. So everybody is trying to connect the Newtonian, Einsteinian theory of physics with uh, the string theory, right? With with quantum mechanics, they're like two these two competing theories in physics. Everybody agrees that the the two these two theories they work. We can create, we can launch spaceships and do amazing experiments and create amazing things with them. But on on the on the technical front, you know, when they do the math, when they're trying to connect these, it just doesn't work. They can't seem to make this unified theory. And that's, you know, that's a big quest now in the world of physics that's been going on for decades. How do we take these two competing theories about the world, two different points of view of how to see the world? Mm -hmm. Both work, by the way. They both work. And yeah, they both work and connect them. And in Chinese medicine philosophy, we have the same. We have five phases mm -hmm. and we have uh, Tai Chi, Bagua. They are. They, they have been correlated in terms of the biological organs, because the, there are the the twelve major organs, and then there are the five phases, and together they kind kind of manage to core. And the, of, of course, the the eight extraordinary meridians. So that 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 can be correlated with Bagua. So you they they found a way to correlate Bagua and Taiji with the five phases. So th that's very good. And they did this a long time ago. However, in terms of the psyche itself, so the, the Chinese have the psyche being constructed of so-called five shen, five spirits. So we have the po and the zhi, the hun, the shen, and the yi. Okay, the, the po, zhi, hun, shen, and yi. 
These are five components of the human psyche. Each of them is something else entirely. Now, what I suggest is among these five, the shun, the fourth one, that's the one that's correlated with our hearts, I would say that's our ego in the Western sense of the world, the word. So we, we know, you know, in the Western world that the ego is correlated with the heart, with the heart energy. If someone gets at, angry, you know, his, his blood starts flowing, his heart starts pumping, you know, we feel deeply, you know, we, our ego is wounded. We feel like someone punched us or stabbed us in the heart, you know, stuff like that. So the Shen component of Chinese medicine, of Ch the Chinese psyche, that's related to the heart. That's what we, that's the element. That's the phase we use in our psyche to uh, make our personality and character. I think that if we were to break down the shin of the five phases, the way it would be broken down is to Jung's eight cognitive functions. So each person's shin is his personality type manifested because a personality type is not who you are. It's your uh, innate inclinations that create the personality. What, what do we mean by that? If we take these five components, we take the, the po, the, the, the po, the ju, the hon, the shen, and the yi, these five components, together they make the personality. But the shen by itself is the mechanism which builds character and personality and ego. It, it constructs it. Okay? So what constructs the personality according to Jung's theories? The eight cognitive functions, or what we would call the personality type. So in fact, here is the connection. Within this cycle, if you can imagine these, uh, the, the way that they draw these five phases in Chinese philosophy and Chinese medicine, they, they draw them like five stars or five balls connecting with each other. And one of these five balls, called the shen, contains within it the eight cognitive functions. Then that would connect and relate the theory of five phases with the Taiji and the Bagua and Jung's theories of the personality. And now I should say that many people consider the Jungian typology, the concept of the 16 personality types and the cognitive functions to be pseudoscience. They do not believe it or they think it might be charlatanism or maybe it's not so effective. And there are, of course, also competing, competing theories like the Enneagram. Enneagram is a five phase based uh, theory of personality from the Western world. However, I have a friend, a colleague, whose name is Professor Dario Nardi. Dario Nardi. And he was a professor up until recently in UCLA. And he conducted serious scientific research in the field of Jungian personality psychology. And he put electrodes on people's brains. And he had each person tested for hours on end, doing anything, solving math problems, playing, uh, talking about their life, um, acting like you'd act in a theater, anything you can imagine. And via these electrodes, the EEG uh, electrodes he put on their skulls, he managed to observe scientifically and record that indeed different personality types have different brain patterns. And these brain patterns to more or less repeat themselves if you introduce the same personality type under the electrodes, even if it's a different person of a different age, et cetera, et cetera. It is predictable. You can put these electrodes on someone's brain and for, most, for the most part, most of the time, know their personality type based on what these electrodes read. And he had written a book about this research and it is called The Neuroscience of Personality. Neuroscience of Personality, it's available on Amazon. It's a brilliant book by a brilliant researcher and he is very cautious because this research had only been conducted on a few hundred, pe a few hundred people so he doesn't want to proclaim yet that this is total scientific proof. But I take it to be that, just that. And I mean, the MBTI, Jung's 16 personality, personality types, it's so effective and so useful that it had been utilized by the US military and countless companies and organizations and schools and whatnot worldwide for many decades now. It's a proven tool. So. It, it was scientific even before they put it in the yeah. lab. It's interesting that, well, just the ways that we can observe brain function these days is, is so phenomenal. I know that there was some research done some years ago where they were putting people in a functional MRI machine and then 
stimulating certain acupuncture points. And they'd find that certain points like Guangming, bright eyes, point on the leg, gallbladder channel, lights up the visual cortex. Yeah, because this the system goes to to the eyes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I want to get back to this for just a moment. We're we're talking here about Jung's types. We're talking about thinking, feeling, intuition, and sensing. And let me make sure I got this right, because you've been covering a lot of material here. Mm-hmm. There's introverted and extroverted aspects of these four. That gives us the eight. There's our Bagua. Mm-hmm. Are you also suggesting that the, not to shun aspect of spirit, but the poor jury and um, poor jury and hun relate to these four, this uh, thinking, feeling, intuition, and sensing? No, not directly. And there is a biological and a technical explanation for this. First of all, if we'll consider the shun, mm. this is a very human trait of the psyche because the shun to a large extent is related to the neocortex in terms of, if we take the shun to be the personality, the character of a person or the, the mechanism which creates that personality and character, then beyond the meridians themselves and the functions of the heart, This is related to the neocortex. That's the most evolutionarily evolved part of the human brain. It's something we share with primates, but no other animal on earth has a neocortex as developed as humans do. Well, except the dolphins. Except, really? Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So um, I didn't know that. I hadn't a clue. But it would make sense. Yeah, majestic animals. So... The Shen is, uni- is very uniquely human in the way that it manifests, you know, the way we describe it in Chinese medicine. It's not that animals, other animals don't have it, but it's not as sophisticated in its mechanisms. You know, um, other animals cannot really get bipolar disorder, not in the way that a human gets it. Right. They don't get depressed either. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, no, you know, a, a cat or a dog, they can get depressed. But again, it's not clinical depression like in a human. It's... It's a slightly different manifestation. It's not as complex. Uh, So what I would say is the other components of the five spirits, they would affect the person in different ways. So if if someone has a personality type, that personality type does not determine at all who that person is going to be because that person, first of all, he has choices. So we make our own choices in life. The personality type is more like the type of glasses we wear. I, I, well, the way I explained it to students, I just had um, several very long seminars uh, totaling in 42 hours of lectures on Jungian personality psychology. So it's all fresh in my mm. mind. There's a lot to talk about. And uh, the way I explain the personality types to them in, in terms of how they function, I say, it's the glasses you wear. Some, some person wears pink glasses. Some person... Uh, wears glasses that, that are all the colors of the rainbow. Some person wears black glasses. And you can also switch between them. So every cognitive function, when you use a cognitive function, it's like you did put a different pair of glasses to deal with a different situation. So yes, you put a pair of pink glasses, but what do you see through these pink glasses? That's up to you. Your, the interpretation is up to you. And if we look at the other components of the five spirits, we look at the po, the jir, the hun, and the yi, uh, they determine some of these things. So the Po, the Po is, um, it's like the little devils and angels sitting on your shoulders. It's the, some, some ideas you have on how do you want to act. You know, it's the basic, basic drives to, for action, not instincts, but psychological drives for action. So there's the, there would be that Po that tells you, eat that chocolate cake. There's that other Po that says, family comes first. And there's that uh, other Po that says, I just want to spend a day in the forest and not work. And it's like those competing urges to go do something. But how do you go about doing something? Uh, the po is then related to the jur. Jur is the kidney energy. Okay, and jur they often translated as you know will, willpower. But actually, the the jur is the will, the motivation to put yourself on track. It's like if you were um, if you were trained. And you've gone off track. If you have enough jur, you have enough 
motivation, you have enough courage, you take the train, you put it back on track. It's the, it's the track that leads to your destiny, the path that leads to your destiny. If you want to get somewhere, you need courage, you need drive, you need that kidney energy, the ding to drive you on that path. And then once you have your ideas and you're being driven on the path, so what would be that path? We're talking about the Hun. Hun is the ancestral spirit, I would call it, but not necessarily just that. It's stuff you were born with, a preconceived notion of your potential. Mm -hmm. So if like, like we, we talked about, you know, young children and, and what they're being exposed to and triggers that reveal to them their true self. You know what the Hon is? The Hon is, is the answer for the Japanese, uh, medi the Zen Japanese meditative question, the Kwan, that asks, how did you look like before you were born? So when you're asked to meditate on the question of how did you look like before you were born, they don't mean, you know, all the Westerners, they just lift their hands and I look like the fetus. Here's my ultrasound. That's how I looked like before I was born. But <laughs> no, that's not what they mean. What they mean is what was your self image, your innate self image, your inherited self image that you inherited from your parents and from your ancestors. Some say from divine inspiration, you know, like Mozart from before you were born. And if you can connect to that hon, to that spirit, then you have creativity, then you have inspiration, then you have destiny. You have something that tells you, you can be that. The hon can be several things. You know, I can be a musician and I can be an author and I can be a prime minister. You can be all three of these things. But for most people, it's one thing in particular or one general path. Okay, so say, you are destined to work with your hands. Well, you can be a farmer, you can be a martial artist, you can be a carpenter. You can be a surgeon. Yeah, you can be a surgeon. But but the hun is has the shape of you, the image of you working with your hands. And like my colleague, Professor Jakovic, he says, it's not like you imagine what the hun would look like. It's that you, you are created in the image of your hun, which is very true. I mean, you are the blueprint of your ancestors. And you know, I thought about it the other day. My younger brother and I, when we were children, we looked like identical twins. We we're four and a half years apart. We really looked similar. Nowadays, no one could tell we we're brothers. And I take it that the way we manifested as adults biologically, in terms of both how we look on the outside and personality wise, mm -hmm. it's not just about who we are and who we chose to be and how we personally develop. It's also that your, your care, I, I truly believe this, that your, it, and it's scientifically unproven still, that your character, your personality, and your hun manifest differently your genes and determine how your body develops and how you change, even once you finish growing, even past the age of 18 or 24. Well, what, what you're getting into here, and this is really important, this is big science stuff these days, is the influence of epigenetics. Mm-hmm. And that epigenetics, it can be stuff that comes from our environment or it can even be stuff that comes from, you know, our inside, our emotional stance, the way that we think about things it can turn genes on and off. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, what you're saying here with this aspect of hun, that it can affect us at an absolute physiological level. Mm -hmm, definitely. Make an awful lot of sense. So, um, e even... Once you, you're, you're finished with your physical growth past the age of 18, 23, 24, still the way you're going to evolve and look at uh, 60 and 70 and 80 years of age really depends not just on environmental factors. It depends on your innate character. Mm. And, 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 you know, in personality theory, a lot of people have noticed in Jung's personality theory that a lot of these 16 personality types, often you take people of the same type and they tend to have the same smile or the really similar smiles, or they tend to have very similar facial expressions or that their skulls develop in similar ways. Mm. And it often doesn't make sense. They can come from all across the world, you know, from very different families, ancestries could be 10,000 years of ancestry apart. And you say, how does it happen? You know, and it really brings the question of whether personality type you're born with it or develop it at a very young age. At the least, you develop it at a very young age because that's when you can already see the type manifest. But I think that based on the personality type and the way it pushes the personality to develop, 
people all, all already change the way their bodies develop. And, and that's a very interesting facet here. So we got the Hun, and then the Hun, which is your ancestral image of yourself, it affects the Shun, which could, it's partly your personality and character and partly your personality type. Uh, and that's the Shun is the mask you were. It's the personality is the, it's, Jung called this the persona. It's what we show to other people, but our true selves from within is more closely related to our Hun. So you're saying our, our true self is more Hun, Shun is... The mind. Is, is more the mind. Well, yeah, I mean, mind gets interesting because mind in Chinese, the way the character is written, it can mean heart, you know, like boom, boom, beating in your mm -hmm. chest heart, but it also means mind, capital M, mind. It means both. Yes, because, uh, well, the, the Shun is not just our personality and character, it's also our conscious mind. So we, we, we said this Shen, in my opinion, is, is related in function also to the near, to parts of the neocortex, and that's the human consciousness. So th th it's all mingled together. And then we got the, the final part, which is even higher consciousness, is the Yi. So in humans, the Yi is, uh, you, it can be translated as intention and also as intellect. So it, that's literally using our intelligence, our logical intelligence. Uh, that's associated with the spleen. It, it's funny, it's, it's very ironic looking at this from the Chinese medical point of view because the spleen is your digestive system and the spleen is related to intelligence. So essentially, if you eat crap, if you eat junk food, then that, gets, that, that makes you stupid, <laughs> according to <laughs> Chinese theory. That's essentially what it says. Well, you know, interestingly enough, I mean, we often will see this, right? If you're, if you're nourishing yourself with healthy foods and healthy thoughts for that matter, your life is going to unfold very differently than if you're nourishing yourself. Well, it's not even nourishment, right? You're, or you're attempting su to sustain yourself with things that don't actually help build you up, either on a physical level or a psycho-emotive level. So maybe we, we, we summarize everything by relating all of what we've talked about to the martial arts. Mm. So if we were to look at this from the perspective of a martial arts teacher, it's very important to understand where people are coming from. And the easiest way to understand where people are coming from is via their personality types. Because the personality types are not who they are as people. You know, they're much more than that. Every person is unique. It, can't, it cannot be stereotyped by a single description of a personality type. But the personality types tell us what they are seeking uh, at, at a very, you know, a, a, on a, on, in their everyday function. We all seek, I write, I write off this in, the, in my book, The Martial Arts Teacher. All of your students always seek happiness. That's the end goal. Everyone wants to be happy. That's what parents want their children to be. What do, you want to, what do you want your children to be? To be happy, of course. So when students come to you, that's the end goal. They want to be happy. Of course, they would rather be happy by eating chocolate cake at the martial arts class, but they can't be happy the way they think they want to be happy. That's another story. But beyond, if, if we go to the basics, that's the, really the end goal, being happy. Different um, personality types. So let's take a personality type who is an extroverted feeler. So extroverted fe feeling is his, his or hers most prominent, powerful cognitive function because there is a hierarchy. The first four cognitive functions out of the eight, the first four would determine the personality type and the first four are by a descending order. There is a superior function, auxiliary function, tertiary function, and in inferior function. And the biggest, strongest one will determine your overall inclination. So if you are an extrovert feeler, so what, what do we say we, you are about? You are about empathy. Now, depending on the person, could, could manifest as positive empathy or negative empathy, but you want to connect emotionally with other people. Now, such a person, you're not going to win them over, even in a martial arts class, with pure logic. You have to get give them a sense of the feeling of it. So... You, you cannot tell them, look, if you put your hand at a 45-degree angle and this person comes at a 90-degree angle 
and now you clash with uh, that percentage of power. That's all very math. Like that's not gonna be. That that's not gonna touch them at all. Yeah, yeah. That that's the worst thing you you. That's the worst way you can talk uh, with these types of folks. But if you were to touch them, you you'd be working together and you'd be flowing. But you can't stand far away from them all the time because they're extroverts. They want this connection. They want this touch. So throughout, you you'd be doing a um, a partner drill with them. And throughout that, you'd be saying, how does that make you feel? And they say, makes me feel powerful. You say, yeah, you know, that really gives you power. Can you feel it? And you give them a little bit of pressure. And then they really feel it. And they, they get a, a feeling sense of it, not a sensory sense of it. Because there are people, for, for instance, who are extroverted sensors. They want to feel the, the sensory input. They want, to, they want to feel you physically more than they want to feel you emotionally. But this 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 person, you you can really touch their hearts in that in that manner. And if we take the opposite, because what would be let me ask you, what would be the opposite function to extroverted feeling? Um, introverted thinking. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And and that's its uh, complementary pair. That's the yin and yang here. So the complementary to extroverted feeling is introverted thinking. Complementary to extroverted thinking is introverted feeling. That's how it works. Now, if we take an introverted thinker, if the extroverted feeler is all about emotion and empathy, the introverted thinker, no, they want it all clean logic, you know, angles, percentages, the math, the, the, the reasoning behind this. They want to reason. They want the reason behind it. So you, you come at them and you explain a technique and you say, you know, the reason that this works is that scientifically speaking, ta, 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 and that makes a lot of sense to them. Right. And then if you give them a math equation, they're really happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. Th that usually doesn't work in martial arts because these are arts and not sciences. Well, and then and my suspicion is with any of this kind of stuff, it's about having some flow and flexibility to be able to use all of it. It, let, let me just summarize this because we're 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 getting to the point where we need to wind this down. I want to make sure that I'm following here because what I think I'm hearing you say is we've got these different yin and yang ways of of sensing or feeling. We could be going outwards. We'd be looking at things inwards. That gives us a particular way of looking at life. It gives us a particular stance, a kind of way we want to be connected with preferences mm -hmm. for how we like to connect with others. And at least from the martial arts point of view, and I would, and I would even go so far as to say the medicine point of view as well. Partly the art here is to know what our sort of certain habits and biases are so that they don't get in the way of being able to know how we can connect with this person over here. You know, earlier we were talking about empathy and, and you were talking about it as really an incredibly powerful thing. And it's powerful because it allows us to know how to connect with other people, not in a thinking way, but in an emotional way. So the practice of martial arts, this is a question that's just forming in my mind, is the practice of martial arts, that ability to have some ways of knowing how to connect with this person that's opposite you yes most definitely so of course it would have been better if we were all versed in Jungian personality psychology and then we would have known how to apply the theory etc etc but that takes a lot of time to learn many hundreds of hours to get very proficient at it, and you need hands-on experience with it too but you can intuitively understand much of these things and how to work with people with martial arts practice and give you just uh, practical examples. So um, you have your eight cognitive functions and we already said that a personality type is made of the four most dominant ones in a descending order. Now, a, a goal and a challenge in life is what Maslow and Jung and others have called individuation. Now, individuation is the process of cultivating shun in, in a positive way in construction constructing character and personality, and in a way also connecting with your hun. And 
This process in the, of individuation, from the point of view of Jungian personality psychology, is the process of developing your cognitive functions. Now, they all develop together. You can't just develop one. You, what, once you develop your, your strongest one, then you have the capacity to develop more the second one and the third one and then the fourth one, etc., etc. And the more you develop some of them, you can develop the rest, but it cannot be unbalanced. Otherwise, you become emotionally and psychologically unbalanced. Now, with martial arts, you touch upon all of these cognitive functions in very different ways. For instance, all of martial arts that at the most basic rudimentary level engage with extroverted sensing. That's sensing in the here and now. That's your sensory connection with what's going on around you. So extroverted sensing is that moment when you're doing a partner drill with someone and he's a friend, but he's gonna launch a punch at your face. And no matter what you're thinking, that punch is gonna come. You cannot intuit it, you cannot think it, you cannot feel it, you can only sense it. And what type of sensing? Not introverted sensing, not the sensing sensing the, the sensations, using the senses from what you sense within your body or the sensations of what's going on within your body, but rather extroverted sensing because you got to relate to that. Because you see a fist coming at your face. Yeah, exactly. So that on the most fundamental level, extroverted sensing is a function that the all martial arts train all the time. Now, if we want to comprehend martial arts theory, many a time we need reasoning. Reasoning is often uh, being perceived and used via the introverted thinking function. Yeah, you think on the inside, that's form of reasoning. Though you can reason in other ways too. But if you want to listen to your teacher and that teacher is giving a very complicated technical lecture and you wish to, to connect with what he's saying and understand that, then that's extroverted thinking. Because you, you put your thinking out there, you try to the way you put empathy out there and you synchronize your, the feeling of the other person with your feeling, here you're synchronizing the thinking of the other person. In that case, your teacher or a friend who explains something to you with your thinking. And once more, you, in the martial arts, you're forced to do this because if you didn't understand the drill correctly, you might get yourself injured or you might get frustrated because you didn't understand it or you might not learn. It's a sort of, you're, you're not going to, you know, have a test and maybe you pass, maybe you fail. No, the, the punch is going to come and you have to know how to deal with it. That person is going to apply a, a joint lock on you and you have to know how to counter it. Otherwise, it's not going to work. It's either this or that. So in with regard to all of the cognitive functions and the things they do in the human psyche and with the human mind and body, the martial arts give you a sort of environment where you step out of your comfort zone. And you have to use all your eight cognitive functions and all of your five spirits uh, to their fullest capacity and use them well, even uh, on the level of intuition. We didn't speak of extroverted intuition and introverted intuition. You know what? That is something that sounds fascinating, and I'd love to talk about it, but I think we're going to have to put that in our part two. Fantastic. Sure thing. <laughs> yeah, we, we should yeah. definitely make it happen. Yeah. So... We need to wind this thing down. Any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave with the listeners before we uh, say goodbye for today? Martial arts are holistic systems, tra authentic, traditional Chinese martial arts, that is. And to really understand these systems, you need to do some scholarly work and research in other fields of study. It matters less which fields of study these happen to be. For me, it happens to be uh, Jungian personality psychology and gardening and history and, and whatnot. But you may choose other things. Some of my students are musicians and, and they do some of that research for music. But it's through that research that you can connect and relate with the martial arts better because you cannot only understand and comprehend the martial arts fully for what your teacher is saying in class or what's what comes from within your own personal lineage. You need an outsider's perspective. For, in, it, just as with everything else in life, you need at least two points of view to understand and comprehend an issue, and preferably three or four of them. As long as these are complete and holistic systems in themselves, that's good enough. So whether it be Chinese medicine or the traditional Chinese martial arts or whatever you like to do, 
go by that approach and you would definitely be successful. Great. Jonathan, thank you so much for making the time today. And I'm going to look forward to a part two. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. And that really took a interesting turn, didn't it? We had <laughs> a number of questions and ideas for discussion and we went a totally different route. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Everyday Acupuncture. If so, please take a moment, click on the iTunes review button, and leave a review of the show. And be sure to tune in again next week.